This is the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the ninth ninth chapter. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on a mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent and and in those days told no one any of the things that they had seen. On the next day, when they came down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. Just then a man from the crowd shouted, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son. He is my only child. Suddenly a spirit seizes him, and and all at once he shrieks. It convulses him until he foams at the mouth. It mauls him and will scarcely leave him. I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Jesus answered, You faithless and perverse generation, how much longer must I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon dashed him to the ground in convulsions. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And all were astounded at the greatness of God. This is the Gospel of the Lord. So there's great power in presence. There is great power in presence. And there is a researcher from Harvard, a social psychologist, who studies this idea of there being power in one's presence and also power in one's body language. And she just came out with a book that I've been listening to on my iPhone, and it's called this, Presence, Bringing Your Boldest Self to Your Biggest Challenges. And this book came out not too long ago. But there's also a YouTube video that went viral about four years ago where she did a TED Talk. I don't know if you're familiar with these TED Talks. There there are hundreds of them, thousands of them on YouTube on different topics. And so for her TED Talk, she was talking about the power of presence. And what she talks about is how our presence and our body language often communicates more about us than what we say or what we do. So if you are standing tall and you look confident, then people more than likely will see you as a confident person. If you're slouching like this and kind of closed in, then people are going to see you as less confident. So in my family, we're a bunch of nerds. And whenever we gather together, we uh, share books and we watch these TED Talks, these informational uh, lectures. And so it was a year ago uh, and we, when we watched this uh, TED Talk by this author, Amy Cuddy, talking about presence. And my sister-in-law, Carla, was the one that suggested that we watch it. So this is Christmas 2014. So we're, we're gathered around the computer and we're watching this TED Talk. And so she talks about, um, one of the things she talks about is the whole notion of power poses. So if you stand like this and kind of stand tall, then people are going to look at you as being more confident. And if you hunch over like this, then people look at you as less confident. And I thought this was great, because I have a tendency to slouch. My wife is always telling me, Aaron, stand up straight. Gut in, chest out, stand up straight. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to give this a try. So the next day, I'm at the YMCA, and I'm uh, working out with the machines, that sort of thing. 
And I get done with one of my sets, and I thought, I'm going to try one of these power poses. So I'm standing there like this, got my baseball cap on, looking around, pretending that I own the room. And then this guy comes up to me, and he says, excuse me, sir, I don't mean to be weird at all, but has anybody ever told you that you're a spitting image for Peyton Manning? <laughs> and I said, sir, I have been mistaken for Charlie Brown. I have been mistaken for Elmer Fudd. But Peyton Manning, I have never been mistaken for. Sir, you just made my year. I thought, this presence stuff, this really works. There's great power in presence and how we carry ourselves, right? People pay attention. So my sister-in-law, Carla, thought this was the funniest thing in the world. So for the last year, my family has been jokingly calling me Peyton. Uh, that's my nickname. So fast forward another year. This is this past Christmas. We went out to San Francisco to visit Carla and her husband, David, my brother-in-law and sister-in-law. They live in North Bay of San Francisco, not too far away from Napa Valley. So we travel up to Napa Valley to go check that out, look at the wineries, that sort of thing. So we're at this winery, and I'm standing there. And I've been joking with Carla about power poses and Peyton Manning. And so I'm standing there like this, got my ball cap on, pretending that I own the place. And one of the workers comes up to me and says, sir, I've got to tell you something. You look like a, a professional football player. You look, like, you look like one of the quarterbacks. You're a spitting image for Peyton Manning. <laughs> and my sister-in-law is right there, and she just about hits the floor laughing. And then she accuses me that I paid the guy off to tell him <laughs> that. I did not. I was so excited. So I don't care what happens this year. Horrible things can happen to me. My year has been made again, because this guy told me that I look like Peyton Manning. I even got my picture taken with him. I'll have to bring it next time. But there is great power in presence. And today's gospel, we learn about the transfiguration. Jesus is on top of the mountain with Peter, James, and John. And in this story, we learn that there is great power in presence. So, there they are on top of the mountain praying, and the disciples kind of allude, or the gospel alludes to the fact that the disciples are kind of asleep, and all of a sudden Jesus' face changes, his presence changes, and his clothes turn dazzling white, and they really start to pay attention, and they see Jesus in all his glory. And perhaps they even begin to understand that this Jesus really is the guy that he says he is, the Son of God. They understand in a new way. And Peter turns to Jesus and says, let's stay here. Let's build three dwellings, and let's just hold on to this moment. And all of a sudden, the cloud is there. Oh, and the presence of Elijah and Moses is there as well. This is an amazing scene. And after Peter says that, let's build three dwellings, this cloud envelops, envelops them. And God's voice comes down and says, this is my son, my chosen, listen to him. Can you imagine what that would have been like? And then all of a sudden, all of those things disappear. Moses and Elijah disappear, and the cloud disappears, and it's just Jesus and Peter, James, and John. And so then they make their way down the mountain the very next day, and they encounter this young boy who is possessed by a demon. And the disciples can't cast this demon out. But Jesus uh, says, bring the child to me, and he rebukes the demon. The presence of Christ is very powerful. As the boy is coming to him, the demon leaves this boy, and he is healed. So our gospel lesson today teaches us that the presence of Christ is more powerful than you can ever imagine. The presence of Christ gives us healing. The presence of Christ gives us hope. The presence of Christ gives us peace and strength. The presence of Christ gives us new life. The presence of Christ is more, more powerful than you can ever imagine more powerful than the arm of Peyton Manning, more powerful than the Broncos or the Panthers, more powerful than anything you can imagine. 
And the presence of Christ is on top of the mountain. The presence of Christ is down in the valley. The presence of Christ is everywhere we go. The presence of Christ is in worship. When we gather here, we experience Christ's presence. We experience Christ's presence in communion when we take the bread and the wine, the body and blood of Christ. Christ's presence is in, with, and under the bread and the wine when we take communion. Christ's presence is in confession when we hear the words, you are forgiven. Christ's presence is in the beautiful moments of life, like the birth of a child or seeing a beautiful scene in God's creation. Christ's presence is in the beautiful moments, and Christ's presence is in the darkest of moments as well, when we lose a loved one or when we hear of a cancer diagnosis. Christ's presence is there. But sometimes it can be really hard to know that Christ's presence is there, especially when we're going through those dark times. But Christ's presence is there because Christ's presence dwells within each and every one of us. We receive the presence of Christ in our baptism. When that same spirit that descended on Jesus in his baptism, that descended on all of the, the three disciples and Jesus on that transfiguration day, that same spirit descended on us in our baptism and said, you are my daughter, you are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. Christ's presence dwells within each and every one of us. And Luther talks about because of that, Martin Luther says because of that, because Christ's presence dwells within us, we are to go out and share that presence with others and be little Christs, he talks about, to our neighbors, to reflect the light of Christ's presence into the lives of our neighbors, to go out into the world and to be little Christs to the world. And C.S. Lewis talked about how this is what the church is all about, to go out into the world and to make little Christs. He puts it in this way. The church exists for nothing else but to draw men and women into Christ, to make them little Christs, if they are not doing that, all the cathedrals, clergy, mission, sermons, even the Bible itself are simply a waste of time. God became man for no other purpose. So God calls us to be little Christ and to reflect the light of his love into each other's lives. But how do we do that? How do we be Christ's presence to one another? Well, there are a whole myriad of ways to do that, to be the presence of Christ, to be that little Christ to your neighbor. Dietrich Bonhoeffer uh, was a very famous Lutheran theologian. He lived at the time of World War II and was active um, during that time as a theologian and as a pastor. And one of the things that he did is he had this underground secret seminary. And he wrote a book about his experiences called Life Together. And in that book, he talks about seven different ministries, about living life together, seven things that we can do as Christians to care for one another. And I think these seven ministries can also be helpful for us to think about in how we are to be a little Christ to one another, to be the presence of Christ to one another. And I, I used these a few months ago, but I think these are really helpful. So these are some things to think about what it means to be Christ's presence to your neighbor. So he talks about the ministry of holding one's tongue. And I think this is an interesting one. So using our words to build one another up instead of tearing one another down. He talks about the ministry of meekness, holding your neighbor up higher than you are, being meek. He talks about the ministry of listening. My grandma always told me, God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason, right? So we can be Christ's presence to our neighbor through the way that we listen. He also talks about the ministry of helpfulness, helping out our neighbor. We can be a little Christ by being helpful to our neighbor. He also talks about the ministry of proclaiming, proclaiming Jesus Christ crucified and resurrected, telling people through our words and our actions about Jesus. He talks about the ministry of bearing, and this is to weep with those who weep and to rejoice with those who rejoice, to bear one another's burdens. And then lastly, he talks about the ministry of authority, 
remembering that God is in charge, that God is the one who created you and me, and to remember that God is, will take care of us no matter what. So again, it's the ministry of holding one's tongue, meekness, listening, helpfulness, proclaiming, bearing, and remembering that our authority comes from God. So today, maybe you will be watching the Super Bowl. Maybe you'll be reading a book. If you're watching the Super Bowl and you're, you're watching those two powerful teams battle it out, as you're watching that, remember this. Christ's presence dwells within you, and Christ's presence is more powerful than you can ever imagine. Amen.